But what's really important here is that those things don't just help us cope, quote unquote, cope with the stress, cope and heal from trauma, not just that, but really enriching our life now and also moving forward. And that's what Dicky Guy is about. That is Assistant Professor of Alberta University, Shintaro Kono, and this is episode 21 of the Ikigai Podcast. Find your Ikigai at ikigaitribe.com. Hello, it's Nick Kemp here with the Ikigai Podcast, and in this episode, I welcome back expert in leisure behavior science, Assistant Professor of the University of Alberta, Shintaro Kono. Shin, thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. Thank you, Nick, for having me again. It's always my pleasure. It's great to chat with you again. And this completes a a three-part series on on the subject of Ikigai. On episode four, we discuss your research on valued experiences and how Ikigai relates to leisure. On episode 17, we talked about experiencing Ikigai in the context of interpersonal relationships. And Shin, you also hosted a webinar as part of the Ikigai Tribe Coaching Certificate Program earlier this year in which you shared your research and insight on today's topic. And my coaching group really enjoyed that webinar with you. It was a great success. Thank you so much for being a part of that. I enjoyed that too. Thank you. On this episode, we will discuss Hokose. Is that correct? Hokose. Yeah. Good pronunciation. <laughs> which uh, I learned from you can be translated as life directionality, where we can experience Ikigai from associations with the past, present, and future. So I'm really excited about this subject. So let's get into it. In 2019, you published a study theorizing the temporal aspects of Ikigai or life worth living among Japanese university students, a mixed methods approach. So what were the mixed methods? Yeah, mixed methods are the um, research approach in social sciences typically combine qualitative and quantitative methods. In this case, uh, what I did was first I conducted our what is called a photo elicitation interview. Um, so I ask students to pick up uh, pictures in their cell phones that they thought were related to their Ikigai. And then we had interviews around that, those pictures. And then after that, you know, after all the findings and themes came out from that uh, interview studies, I created a theory. I tried to test that the- theory and theoretical model in a later quantitative large-scale survey with about 670 or so students from all over Japan. I see. So you had these fairly intimate discussions with people who had uh, presented their photos to you, but you also did large-scale research on the same subject. Exactly. Awesome. Well, let's define the word hokose. How would you define it? Well, according to the Japanese dictionary, hoko means direction. Very simple. And this, the last part, sei, S-E-I, it's a suffix that doesn't really have a meaning in itself, but it's just add or abstract nature to a word. So it's really directionness, if you will, directedness, really. Um, but the Japanese students um, that I talked to use the word the expression in such a way that talking about this, this I wouldn't say too loose, but it's a, it's a bit of a loose sense of where they're coming from and where they are and where they want to go in the future. So that really the connection associations across the past, present, and the future. And really having some understanding, some connections across them. Really those things are not just accumulation of random events and random actions and random experiences, but there's some meaningful connections among them. Yeah, it was interesting that you noted that your your interviewees freely use this word when discussing um, the past, present, and future. So it wasn't a word that you led with. It was, it was a word they used. I think, yeah, well, typically Japanese people use it pretty colloquially in a daily conversation. It's, it's a very loose, uh, meaning that people often refer to the future, 
um, or we're, you know, future, and it, even in a business context as well, talking about some strategic plan, for example, we use this word HOKO or HOKO say in a way. Uh, but in this context, uh, in terms of Ikigai, students tended to mention both the past to the fu- uh, current as well as the current to the future. Uh, both connections were important. I'm, I'm sure I've heard the word, but it didn't really click for me that it was a, a common word or used in daily conversation. So in short, your, your qualitative findings suggested that when students formed explicit associations with the past, present and future, they gained a strong feeling of ikigai or strong ikigai feelings. So let's talk about these associations. Sure. So in terms of associations, what I found important in terms of hokosei and ikigai are two kinds mainly. And the first kind is in your mind, we can make mentally and psychologically, we can connect our past, past experiences to the current life or the, our, what we are doing, what we are experiencing right now and what we are valuing right now to our future. So this is just the act of your imagination, if you will. Really, it, it's not that you have something necessarily tangible or you know, something really happened, but can you make that a, you know, a connection? It's very reflective. Uh, process, if you will. The other type of association is the behavioral, that uh, by which I mean basically it's about now, right now in your daily life. Do you do activities that you personally value that are also related to your either past and or future, uh, future goals? So that's something that you have to do strategically that let's say you have a time to you know, set up a new hobby. Uh, you have the time, you have the money. What are you going to do? Maybe you want to choose something that allows you to be the person that you want to be in the future or something that helps you to connect to some of their past interests or uh, past experiences to sort of like rediscover the skill sets that you had in the past. So those are the type of uh, behavioral connections that I'm talking about. All right, so in short, we've got uh, cognitive associations and and behavioral, and we'll we'll touch on these a bit more. Well, what stood out for me and what you highlight in your research is related to these associations are two subjective states, uh, life legacy and life momentum. And I really like how you you phrase these uh, learnings. So let's talk about what life legacy is. What is life legacy? Life legacy is this feeling that your past, past experience, past events, past self too, uh, have meaningfully con- contributed to who you are, what you're doing, what you're valuing, and what kind of life you have right now. So really the past, present linkage and in the feeling that you're almost building on top of something you have accomplished whether it's, it's actual gold and things, you know, activities and project, but also uh, your personal growth probably from the past, that you're on, being on top of it, that you're who you are, what you are now, what you're doing right now, it's meaningfully connected to that past. Yeah, I can actually think of a really good example for me, and this would have been my traineeship to Japan in 1995. So I was awarded a, a traineeship to work in a restaurant chain in Japan. And that experience was probably was a Nikigai experience. I had one year in Japan. I, I learned so much about Japan and I learned the language, but I also learned a lot about myself. But that, that experience led to so many other things related to Japan, me meeting my wife, even obviously what I'm doing now. I, I, remember back to that experience and I see it as a very meaningful and positive experience and it, it definitely shaped my past mm-hmm. and has shaped my, my current life. Right. Life legacy, it, you know, we don't have to be old and grey to have a life legacy. It, mm-hmm. It's something, it's like a, a, a journey and I'm, I'm still relatively young. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good point. I mean, I talk to university students in, in Japan uh, university students pretty, you know, in a set age, it's very, you know, 18 to 22. That's the age group I talk to mostly. So really even that 
uh, we would right now call the probably emerging adults, if you will, young adults, emerging adults, they still have much to be proud of really in terms of life legacy. And of course, this will maybe change over time, what counts as legacy and their magnitude of legacy, maybe. Hopefully, you know, as we live, probably the quote unquote, the value of the legacy, you know, the project that we work on, for example, right, career-wise, or the, even the maturity of our hobby, the, just the excellence of it too, will, will maybe increase. You know, maybe the legacy gets bigger and bigger and the leg legacy from 30s could be bigger uh, when you're 60s, for example. Uh, but also we may develop some different, you know, personal values and social values. We live in a dynamic society. So what we really value could change as we go. So it's really, you know, it's not really absolute or it's not really static. It's definitely relative and uh, dynamic process. Yeah, I do like, I do like how you frame it because I think when I've, I've come across the word legacy, it is, is something that people talk about perhaps leaving their children, leaving a legacy to your children or to other people. Mm -hmm. But it's something we can, it sounds like it's something we can develop for ourselves and for others, even when we're emerging adults or in our 30s or 40s and 50s. We can start thinking about this instead of thinking, oh, well, let's wait until I'm retired before I contemplate the legacy I'm leaving. Yeah. So I think it's really cool. And I really like this other term, life momentum. So what's, what's that about? Mm -hmm. This life momentum is the basically opposite of life legacy in a sense that it's a connection. Well, it's the feeling that we get when we have this connection between the present life right now, here and now, what you're doing, what you're valuing, and who you are to the, uh, the future, desired future, whether it's some sort of like a goal pursuit or personal development um, or anything else really desire the future. So that present future linkage. And when you have that, you have this, you know, I just remember that one of your, you know, uh, Ikigai coaching program students uh, described, I forgot who, who he was, but saying that when you have this meaningful goal and uh, you have all the projects and things that you want to do you, that help you to get there, you have this feeling that you are almost floating like 10 centimeter above the ground that you're 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 light in a way you know you it's the the feeling of fired up and you know you get up in the morning and you're just ready to do things basically so that's that feeling um i think that's exactly that's a great analogy to describe what how this life momentum feels like yeah i remember that was mentioned and this this concept reminds me of uh, something I learned from you, and it's about anticipating a bright future, which I learned from you was one of Miyako Kamiya's Ikigai needs. And I, I like to think of Miyako Kamiya as the, the, the mother of Ikigai psychology or Ikigai philosophy, and she was um, a pioneering researcher. And there are seven needs, and one of them is Miraisei, which is a bright future. So I like this idea of linking your present to your future, how you describe this present future linkage. And we do have this need or we do have this desire for a bright future. Yeah, uh, I think that's a really good connection between that Kamiya's work and uh, what I'm trying to propose here. Um, I agree that there is definitely a great deal of connections and overlap here. That, but I also, I also wanted to clarify that Kamiya by bright, you know, bright future, and uh, I mean, I say she meant that one can have this sense of ikigai, even though they're in this, for example, very negative, stra stressful, traumatic situations. As long as they have this idea that their life can turn positive, so in a way that I think that's that's kind of related to where Kamiya is coming from, and she was a psychiatrist, and she. She looked at a lot of people who went through traumatic events where many people didn't really have a lot of control over their life and life events. So I think that was their heart population in a way. And her insight is definitely based on, based on that. My students were not necessarily those, you know, people who went through traumatic events per se, and they're opposite probably in a typical, you know, uh, in a way, what counts as typical students, you know, debatable, but more so. 
So really, like momentum here really speaks to the fact that you have to have this some level of connections, association in your mind, in your life, that your current and future lives are connected, right? Kamiya is a little different, that as long as you have this bright future, that the possibility, it's really sheer possibility, the life can get better, it's good. So maybe I think depending on life situation, we, you know, maybe there's a little bit of differences here, what we can use. Maybe a situation like a pandemic is a good time to revisit Kamiya's work to just uh, thinking about something, you know, well, things can change versus when you get out of, you know, pandemic and you still have more control over your life. Maybe that's the time you really can work on your life momentum because that's when you really want to connect what you're doing to your future. I understand. So it seems like with your, your theory of life momentum, we, we have a sense of control. So that, that was actually one of my questions. Do we have a sense of control? So, so can we action things in our current life for this life momentum? Yeah, I think so, um, that we, we could. Of course, again, that contrast that you, know, you brought up between my work, my insights, and their, you know, Kamiya's insight is very interesting here in a way that she looked at the people who had a really uncontrollable life, really. So in a way, insight from those research can be very useful right now uh, in terms of pandemic. And it, it really depends on how people's life are right now, because I see personally, of course, not I haven't done research yet, but really the pandemic impacted people's life disproportionately. You know, some people yes. are not so affected, but other people are really severely affected. So that depends on that, too. Um, but in terms of control and their uh, life momentum, I think what's important to understand for people is that we don't necessarily have to have the strict linearity and, uh, if you will, causality between where you are to the future. Okay. And that's that's why I translated Hokosei in the context of Ikigai right now in my study life directionality it's the direction it's a loose sense you know pretty loose sense of from where you are what what you're doing to the future and, and just the direction you know maybe along the way there's are hiccups and up and downs and you know some detours and that's fine and you don't really have to be able to pin down i'm doing this which will get you there and that will get you you know and so on and so forth so you don't have to be really i think over scheduling and planning everything because to me ikigai and specifically hoko say it's 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 just about the journey and process of getting there as much as actually getting you if you see what i'm what i'm saying have you ever gotten a meaningful goal right whatever that might be it's a hobby it's a career it's a relationship and when you actually accomplish it whatever that the milestone is you actually feel sad you know what i'm saying after that, you actually, next morning you wake up and you feel like you're a little empty. You, you, you kind of check it off. Like, what are you going to do after in, in the next chapter of your life? You have to find a new. So it's really the life momentum state of the life momentum. It's about the journey of having that goal and moving toward it to that rough direction, which I think is possible right now still. It is something I've, I've learned from, I think, uh, the, the Japanese mindset or Japanese um, philosophy or psychology or, or Buddhism is that the, the process and having this idea that you're moving forward seems far more important or far more meaningful than achieving goals because you're right our goals never eventuate or what we envision or what we imagine will happen when we achieve the goal most of the time doesn't happen we achieve it there's some short-lived sense of success or happiness but then it just doesn't seem to satisfy us in the way we hoped. And as you say, we, we've got to keep moving. We've got to keep going. But that process should be meaningful. So my understanding is now that we don't really have to action things, but it seems like we can essentially choose how to think or feel about past experiences or how we can anticipate the future with these cognitive associations you, you mentioned before. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really interesting. We could look back on past experiences and think about them and maybe almost take a new perspective on them. And we can also 
choose to how to think or feel about our future. So this is the, that's the about the cognitive association you're talking about that we use our mental capacity to imagine and potentially reimagine our past and future and really the meanings of it and what that means basically what the past experience means and what future goals means to you really right now. I think a lot of people sometimes stop there that, you know, what the past means and what the future means. And really it's in, what's important here is to make that connection with what you're doing right now, what kind of experiences you're having and also what you're valuing. And uh, like you said, you know, earlier in episode four, we talked about value, valued experiences or keiken in Japanese. And uh, I specifically talked about um, enjoyment or tanoshimi uh, effort or uh, ganbari and uh, stimulation or shigeki and uh, finally comfort or uh, yashi, the four types of experiences. So what are the experiences that you're valuing right now in your life? Um, you know, can you make that some connection between what you're doing, what you're valuing with the past? I think that connection often missing when you when we tend to think about their uh, past and the future. It really highlights this idea of presence. Presence is so valuable that we, we need to stop and be present and, and relate all these things, you know, mm -hmm. what we're doing to our past or future. And, and one question that comes to mind is when we have or when we're thinking about these cognitive associations, what, what state of mind do we need to be in? Do we need to be optimistic or are we just wanting to be tapping into our true feelings and thoughts? I think that's a really good question. And this is really the area where we need more research in, I feel. And for that, we need our research over time, really, because we're talking about Hoko say over time, right? So um, I think, uh, Nick, you mentioned some of the potential candidates factors here, the optimism, maybe hope, you know, some sort of authenticity, authentic values. I think those are very important and are related to some of the relevant theories that I cited in the uh, paper as well. So I think those are really good speculations here. And that being said, though, um, again, going back to the what really life directionality means, uh, as opposed to such as things like linearity and causality, I think what we have to be, you know, the, the type of mental state and mindset we have to be in is that it's a little creative, I think, space, mental space. And, and sometimes it's really, it's, it's about brainstorming rather than really nailing down a connection, right? So that, hey, I had that experience, you know, can I make a connection with this, you know, almost maybe seemingly really random, you know, at the beginning, you know, experiences, but can you make a connection? Because maybe on a surface level, they look very different, but if you dig down what you learn, for example, what kind of knowledge you got, what kind of skills you got, what kind of new personal growth you uh, experience in those experiences, there may be some underlying connections. And I think those that are, you know, those creativity are very important. Don't be too perfectionistic, if you will, about uh, making sure that, you know, this certificate led to this achievement, this led to that thing. So uh, it's a little more exploratory and it's more um, open. I understand. We're basically trying to consider more possibilities of how our life relates to past and future events, things we've, we've never really taken the time to think about that, oh, this, this event may be... I know it led to this, but maybe there was other things involved or maybe that event led to different things. And I've never right. really considered, considered that. Yeah, that's actually a very interesting point. And it's not something that I've written about or not researched, but I would be interested in pursuing is that maybe some of the experiences has this surface level meaning that's so obvious to you. Like you, you got a degree, right? You got a PhD or whatever that might be. It's the value is academic, it's effort, you know, whatever that might be. It's so obvious to you that it's very important. Actually, there's a memory literature to suggest that some of the experiences are closed. The meaning is closed and it's so obvious to you. And we tend to stop exploring the meaning, the beyond that ob obvious meaning. And I think it's very important that sometimes some experiences are more open by nature, that it's maybe the meanings are fuzzy, the importance are fuzzy to you. They allowed you to explore and think that experience and value from different perspective, which also helps you to connect to their current life and experiences in self 
more arguably in a, in a very interesting, strange way, easily rather than some of the obvious one. Of course, there there there's a pros and pros and cons, but maybe uh, we have to be careful about some of the experiences that are just so obviously you know valued in one way in yourself in your mind, but also in society. And really, we may have to challenge that sometimes. What about this side or that side? Yeah, this is really interesting because it, it reminds me of two things that we we do need to be more self-reflective on our life. We need to take time and think about all, all the events of our life and what they, I guess, what they've meant and how we've, we've perceived them and perhaps think about them and think, oh, okay, how can I rethink them or look at them and re- relate them to who I am and who I was and maybe who I want to be? And there's this other idea I was talking about last night on a, a webinar. I gave a webinar and it was a free webinar and I was sharing some general knowledge on Ikigai. And in the West, we, we have this tendency to, to want to define things. And, and people wanted, they were asking me all these questions saying, oh, is Ikigai this? And oh, if it's not that, is it this? And I'm, I had to say, look, you need to let go of definitions. We all have this tendency to, to think, oh, that's what Ikigai is. But it's very complex, you know, it, it, it has, um, as Ken Moggy sort of says, Ikigai is complex like life is complex. Mm-hmm. And so trying to define it in a sentence is actually not helpful because, as you mentioned, it really limits what we can um, understand from the concept. So I really like this idea of let go of definitions and be, be open to different um, interpretations or perspectives, especially of these amazing Japanese words like ikigai or um, words like hokose or mm-hmm. um, another word, yutori, which I find fascinating. And it almost sounds like we need yutori, this, this mental space, to, to consider things like life momentum or life legacy. I think so. Maybe that's, a, that's another interesting part that we have to explore more that the word yutori was considered to be uh, one of the translations of English leisure sometimes. And, uh, but also Yutori has more nuances and, uh, you know, very Japanese mentality and cultural connotations to it too. That it's definitely a mental, capa- you know, mental space uh, in English and psychology and ex- well, existential philosophical psych- psychology. We have this word posing and pause in life, but also it's, it's a life space too. And I mean, maybe that's my bias that I'm not a psychologist by training. I'm a leisure researcher. I'm, I look at the life rather than people's mind. So that, yes, there is definitely a correlation between probably people's mind being relaxed and or there's a space in the mind, but also you, your life has to have a space and not just a, you know, absolute way that you have to have a one hour of reflection, you know, meditation session every day type of things. But there's this timing of, you know, every day, maybe morning, some people wake up and just rather than doing anything, you just dissect a day, day by 30 minutes looking outside a window with a coffee. Maybe that's the utility for that person, whatever that might be, whatever, however it looks, maybe it's a walk, you know, going outside, not thinking about anything else. So those moments are the times where we're open to ideas, um, association we didn't make in the past. And there are quite a bit of a psychological um, discussions and documentation as to importance of those openness and receptiveness, if you will. A recurring theme I've learned from yourself and other Japanese is there's this casualness approach to Ikigai and I guess you taught it where there are no strict rules, just, just be casual in your approach. Where in the West, we're almost creating this sense of pressure thinking, ah, oh, I have to know what my ikigai is. <laughs> so I do like this casualness where you don't have to say right every morning, yeah, I'm going to meditate from eight to nine. It can be something like, all right, well, I just feel like having my coffee outside or I might pat my cats and, and just relax for half an hour. And you might end up getting the sort of the same benefit with this casual approach to things. And that's something I'm trying to embrace. I do have a tendency to, to get up and want to do things, but I, I do think just, Nick, relax, man. You've got the whole day ahead. Have your coffee. Don't drink it in front of the computer. You know, sit outside. Yeah. 
So that, let's move on, Shim, with these, with these two associations, um, behavioral and cognitive. Your research also revealed two conditions for Hokose, and they were defining the past and clear goals. And I think our audience would understand the importance of clear goals, and we'll, we'll discuss that um, in a minute. But I find this condition, defining the past, fascinating. So can you explain you know, what it means in the context of your theory? Sure. Uh, really defining past is the past experiences, uh, which is basically the valued experiences that I I mentioned in episode four that, you know, effort for enjoyment, uh, stimulating and comforting experience, any of those, maybe a mixture of them that happened in the past, then you're no longer doing it. But they are so powerful that when you reflect back, you oftentimes remember that there is vivid memories around that too. And uh, it's often when we interview people, we talk to people, we just introduce ourselves. Those are the experiences that people often utilize to define who they are, where they're coming from, not just about their location, but also what kind of person they are really. So they tend to mention them as basically, you know, turning points in their life, that in, in their life trajectories. Um, sometimes, you know, something happened and people just quit their job, career, one job and switch to a whole another degree, for example, uh, that, that type of things. Uh, so really powerful, transformative experiences. And people do have those experiences. I've definitely had a few. I actually, now that you mentioned quitting a job, one day I, I did walk out of a job. I just was sitting at the desk and I was extremely stressed. Uh, there'd been workplace harassment, constant pressure. The work was absolutely meaningless and I was depressed. I was frustrated. And I just thought, you can't keep doing this. So I asked a coworker to be a witness. I got a manager. I went in a room and said, this is happening. I've been documenting this abuse and I'm leaving today. And I just walked out and I didn't go back. Uh, I got, you know, my pay, all my holiday pay. And then that's when I really started really going into my online work and entrepreneurial pursuits. And so even though that experience was absolutely horrible, I can look back at it now and think, man, that was a turning point, you know, and I could say, wow, you, you know, you had the courage to do that and thank God you did that and look where your life is now. So that, that is a question I do have and I think it's something we should do often is look back at turning points or, or transformative experiences and, and think about what they mean to us. Right. Again, just to mention Kami Amiko, she, she talks about transformative experiences being very important in the context of Ikigai. Mm. So I, I do wonder with age and life experience, if we can redefine our past. So perhaps challenging experiences we have negative thoughts about, could they be looked back upon mm. as, you know, as these life turning points? Right. And I think that your, your example is, I think it's as painful as, it was probably for you back then. I think it's a brilliant example because throughout the Ikigai literature, you know, Kamiya's work, um, you know, Dr. Kumano, mm -hmm. Michiko's work, and uh, my work itself, it, it's consistent theme in terms of Ikigai is that Ikigai cannot be fully understood and also experienced for lay people if you're categorizing experience positive versus negative. I think we have to really move past that dichotomous sure. framework. That this positive and negative, yes, they exist. And to an extent, it's, you know, that just like a good indicator of like, okay, how your life is right now, really. But beyond that, when you're thinking about stretching that perspective from the past to the future, really sometimes years and decades of your life, really those, you know, momentary positive versus negative really can be actually misguiding in a way that there are some negative, you know, back then it was negative experiences, experiences that you really want to put in Japanese, you know, expression, put a lid on and you never want to open that lid. There are, it, it stinks, you know, it's, it's that I have those experiences too, and I'm probably younger than you, but I do. But it's really important in terms of Ikigai to sometimes when when you're okay with it, probably, you have to be, be probably ready. And I would love to kind of do research about when and how we can be ready uh, to look at those uh, 
powerful yet, you know, negative experiences, quote unquote, negative experiences to get a more ikigai. But when you're ready, I think it's important to open that lid and really take a look at that again, because negative experience can be a powerful, negative memory in the past can be very powerful sources. Most likely we evolved, we grew out of those experiences and that have lingering effect on our life. So it's really a great source of life legacy. It, it is amazing because if I do look back at that day and the weeks leading up to that decision, and, you know, I was ex- extremely stressed. I was on the verge of breaking down. I was almost crying as I was saying I want to leave. So I could look at that always as a, a painful negative experience with a certain mindset. But if I look back thinking, hang on, this ended up changing your life for the better. Mm-hmm. And it's, right. it almost ties in to Buddhism where I could, I could almost thank this person who gave me so much trouble because it, it did end up changing my life. So I like your idea that we, we don't have to really say they're positive or negative. They're almost like life-defining experiences, regardless of if they're, they're negative or positive. Right. Yeah, I think we should be open to this idea that we can go back to past experiences and reinterpret them because we have this new context of all the years from that experience up until now. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of people, the both no, lay people as well as professionals, such as counselors, psychiatrists, have done those works and guided life interviews, visiting their past and reinterpreting it, right? Um, so I think there's this tremendous insight there too. And I'm pretty sure that helped us to move forward with Ikigai. But what's really important here is that those things don't just help us cope, quote unquote, cope with the stress, cope and heal from trauma, not just that, but really enriching our life now and also moving forward. And that's what Diki Guy is about. So it's not just about, you know, kind of like fixing negativity and really and by re- reinterpreting and everything, but also really bouncing back and bouncing up and forward really uh, in your life. And that's that negative piece of the, you know, can be a very important puzzle of that process as much as positive experiences in the past. In a nutshell, is it making, is it making meaning? Yes, there is a lot. There's a quite a bit of meaning making literature, meaning based coping literature that I think I personally drew a lot of insights from. So those are really good in- sources of info, um, insights to look at, but definitely the way I read those literature is they have focused on a more of a, remedying and coping with the negativity, stress. Uh, but definitely there's a lot of insights in there that we can potentially use for Ikigai and moving forward. I understand. All right, so let's talk about the second condition then, clear goals. And again, I like how you define clear goals as present, future links. I mean, definitely clear goals. It's about you know what you want to accomplish in the future. And it's very simple. Right there, it's clear. It has to be clear. And there were a lot of goals that my interviewees talked about in relation to Ikigai. Some of them are pretty broad. Some of them are more clear in terms of what they want to do. So it appeared to me that clearer the goals are, the, it's more magnetic, if you will, that students were drawn toward it. It was clear for them what to do right now. And everything else flowed, followed from there that in terms of you know, cognitive association or behavior association, it's easier for them to do, make those associations and which get to them to their price of state of basically life momentum. So the clearer, the better. So for example, if I want to be, let's say my personal hobby right now is playing badminton, which I can't really because of the pandemic. But if I just want to be better, quote unquote, better at badminton, that's so bro. Like, what am I going to do? Well, I can pray. I can practice probably, but if I have a clear goal that I want to beat this person that I play with, for example, that would be more specific. Then I will analyze the opponents while I will work on a certain techniques that I, I'm lacking, which I think effective for this person, or maybe specific level of competition or whatever that might be. So those are really important in terms of, yeah, some, some goals are more magnetic and really drives you rather than more abstract and broader goals. It seems 
clear goals, they almost lead to you then forming a strategy on, on how to approach them or how, how to achieve them. Yes, exactly. And you're right. I think goal setting, is, I often think, such a, a poor term because it's, it just seems to be set a goal and that's it where maybe goal achieving or goal strategy would be better terms. I also wonder if, is it more helpful to have many goals or is it, is it better to have few or, or it doesn't really matter? I think that's really, again, that's a really good question. And uh, obviously my Hokusei kind of theory and everything, I mean, beyond Hokusei, Kigai theory really focus on our states here. It's the consequences that are life momentums and life legacy. And it's, you know, the process to get their cognitive associations and behavioral associations. So the, the conditions are less developed. And I think it's, it's a kind of one of the, those open spots in that we can, you know, explore in a future research. And there's so much of goal setting literature that I cited, some of them, but there is much more. So yes, uh, the number of goals, that's a very important question. I, the way I see some of their interviewers spoke to that, actually, they wanted to have actually less, few selected goals that are very important to them. Uh, I can remember a few students actually explicitly talking about the state of having too many goals and too many goals that are not clearly defined and they're, that are not meaningfully connected to their life right now was rather confusing time, if you will. It, it just uh, stretches you in every single directions and really doesn't let you deepen each one of those experiences that you are doing right now. So that could be very problematic. Mm. And also um, some of the goal literature suggests uh, this differentiation of more higher order goals that, you know, you want to be a better person, this, this, you know, certain type of person, you know, those are more life goals and there's a bigger picture goals versus more of our complete goals that uh, objectives, if you will, you know, the steps toward it. Uh, maybe both are important. I think I, those are the level that I can't really quite get to based on what we have done so far and we need a more future, I'm a, future research to it. But I would suspect that there are pros and cons for both type in a way, the long-term life goal kind of thing. As long as you can really visualize it in a way, clear way, then it would it would it would be very magnetic. It would be very powerful. It literally changes you. It moves you, but inspires you. But short-term goals are clear, are specific, and it's tangible. And you can get there and you can feel the progress much more every, not every day maybe, but every month or every year even. So that's quite helpful potentially in terms of life momentum. So I think there would be probably pros and cons and there are different roles played by different kinds of goals. So that's that's going to be interesting direction of research. I've thought about this a lot recently. And I think that the way we set our goals, it's almost there's a quality to how you set a goal because like last year I, I set a goal, I want to do 100 podcast episodes by the end of this year. And then I started to rethink that thinking, well, if, if I did that, I might end up compromising the podcast because maybe I, I, I have guests on who maybe would be interesting but they're not really related to the Ikigai concept or and that could end up being... Or meaning, you know, I have a few episodes that really aren't that interesting or not really related to what, what the podcast is about. So now I've reframed the goal thinking I'm going to make the podcast more focused on Ikigai and I'll, I'll have researchers and authors. And for each episode, I'll go for a really meaningful conversation. So that means I've, I've got to prepare. I've got to respect the, the guest and I've got to prepare notes. So I think that's a far better goal than me just saying, well, I want to have 100 episodes by the end of 2021. Mm. I think that's a really good example, again, to illustrate the, you know, you, you're going to have these clear goals, but at the end of the day, you need to connect those goals to what you're valuing, cake and the valued experiences right now. And the valued experience is where the value is coming from. It's, it's you, your personal values which are to an extent influenced by people around your society, around you and all that, historical time, all that. But you have this standard in yourself, like each one of us, whether it's 
it's a good kind of standard or not a good really kind of standard. We all do to an extent, really the compass, right? That we have for you for our life. Now, if our goals are shallow and superficial, if you will, right? You know, just hundred, you know, that sounds triple digit sounds good. But then you, you may find later difficult to connect each of the process of creating podcast and uh, really the entire thing, the project, strongly and deeply to the goals between that experience and goal. So really it's important to have goals that are consistent with your authentic value that really care. I really care about this. Maybe we need to ask ourselves this. Okay, so what? You know, okay, set, set this goal you know, whatever new year's resolution or whatever that might be, but so what, you know, I want to go gym. So what really going to gym is not really important. What I want to do is maybe become healthier or become more active, become stronger. Okay. Then you actually going to gym is not that core to that goal. So what, you know, you really want to clarify what you really care. Thank you, Shen, for saying that. That's, that's what I think I was getting at. That, yeah. Having clarity on, your goals should be strongly connected to your values. And this is something I, I talk about in Ikigai, that Ikigai is probably easy for us to experience if we are living our values and if we're in conflict or we're forced to compromise our values, then Ikigai will be elusive. So, yeah, you're right. We, we should have these goals that relate to our values and then in the pursuit of them we're expressing our values and I think when we do have these superficial goals of oh yeah I'll do 100 podcast episodes that becomes a source of stress because I think oh you know I've only done 20 episodes and then you're worried about stuff that that's not even meaningful it's just a number yeah th- mm-hmm. thanks for highlighting how it's important we relate our values to, to our goals and that can really determine mm-hmm. our, our behavior or actions so, Shin, you, you have developed an actual Hokosei model, which I, with your permission, I'll actually put on the, the notes, in the notes of, the, of this episode. And this is where you tie in valued experiences with your theory of Hokosei. So it might be hard for our audience to visualise, but do you want to break, break it down so that we've talked about the conditions of Hokosei, actions and perceptions of Hokosei, but it's all in this one framework. Sure. Uh, let's start with the maybe perceptions and consequences of Hoko say that once we all that, you know, do the association, making associations, where we want to get at are the, uh, the two perceptions we talked about, life momentum and life legacy. Those are the feelings that you should be feeling when you make the uh, um, associations that we talked about. Really, that's the end goals, okay. if you will. And for that, to achieve those states, there are two behavioral choice that we can make, which is behavioral associations and also sort of reflective mental cognitive associations that we can make. So those are the two types of what I call hokose actions. Although cognitive associations, you're not necessarily moving your body, but it's really mind is moving, your mind is working, and you know, kind of really have to go back and forth in your life from the past to the future. To make those uh, associations, I think that there are two important things uh, very specific to Hokosei uh, that are called the conditions of Hokosei. And those are the things that we just talked about, defining past as well as clear goals. But of course, by definition, as we define it, you know, those cognitive and behavioral associations, they are really making connection between past and present, present and future. And that's what the Hokosei is really about. So we really need this present life, what we're doing right now, and what we're valuing right now. So this valued experiences, again, enjoyable, effortful, stimulating, and comforting experiences that you have right now are the anchor of these associations, that we really need those things. Interesting point here is that, though, uh, maybe engaging in these association, cognitive association or behavior association may help us to actually realize experiences that we actually do value right now, that sometimes some of the things are not so clear to us. Like we do things, so many things in our life. I mean, take a look at your Google calendar. I'm pretty sure there's so many things lined up. We do, but we don't necessarily explicitly value and, oh, this is actually important to us. 
But when we do engage in this hoko, say, the entire processes, uh, you may re- we may realize that, oh, maybe actually related to the past, related to the future goal, this thing that we are doing, I'm doing right now, is actually important to my guy. So really this defining past that it experiences the present and their clear goals from future, these are ingredients of the associations. I understand. So I will put that map you have on the website. But that, that was a really good question you just framed. What's important to my ikigai? That could be a really good question for us to ask ourselves. And going back to these valued experiences we talked about in episode four, just remind yourself, am I, am I doing things that are effortful, enjoyable, um, comforting, and stimulating? I know we talked about one, one good hobby or pursuit is where you, you hit two or three or maybe even four of those valued experiences. Mm-hmm. Or if you don't, you just have several hobbies where maybe one is comforting or maybe reading a book or stretching. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I know for me, playing guitar, where I actually try and write music. So I'm, I'm trying to write a piece. So I'm, I'm tapping into my cre- mm-hmm. creativity. It's, it seems to be comforting. I, I feel so comfortable holding a guitar and it's enjoyable when I do come up with some music and it can be effortful, you know, trying to finish a piece of music and it is in a way stimulating in a, in a creative sense. You almost amaze yourself thinking, wow, I, I, I never thought I could create music or create something like that. Right. I really think it's interesting how we could frame our hobby time or our leisure time Mm -hmm. with these four ideas you discovered were were important based on your research. Uh Right. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up because, I mean, across the three theories that I talked about, KKN, valued experiences, and a basho authentic relationship, and this one, hokosei, or life directionality, I've had this question myself, where is leisure, because that's, you know, my primary academic interest, you know, leisure, is in this hokosei, and that was eh, a little bit of difficulty in terms, compared to the other two theories, I would say, but like your guitar guitar example, that some of the leisure experiences are um, what's sometimes called in our field serious leisure that people actually commit to certain kind of leisure hobby activity typically called as a hobby but really we get serious and committed to it and it's a very rich experience it it could create a lot of you know very rich experiences that have so many different elements that you know of the different experiences and values like you mentioned and those experiences those hobbies really go over time and there's sometimes you may stay away from it for a bit, but that may resurface in your life, depending on things like COVID, right? You know, a lot of people rediscover the hobbies right now uh, during the pandemic as well. So really it, it cuts across the past, present and the future. And uh, when we talk about those life direction, people tend to jump to career. And I think what, Silver lining from this kind of pandemic is that how fragile our career could be. Yes. And uh, we can't, well, sometimes we have to you know, devote a lot of time on our career. But if, if life allows, I think it's important to enrich our life and enrich our leisure in terms of hokose as well. Don't let your hokose reliant just on career. I think that's a little risky in terms of ikigai. And in terms of just life, and uh, if you can do it in a multiple domains, earlier you mentioned relationship. That's great. Family relationship. Have something. You know, long-term friends and everything. That's very important. Have something in your career. That's not a bad thing. It's a very important thing. And then maybe it's something in your leisure. Then if anything happened, like pandemic and not a pandemic, we'll see. But to one of your pillars and your trajectories, you still have so you know, you have still much to support uh, and continue to give your life legacy and life momentum. Yeah, I really like how you presented leisure as one of the most easy and accessible sources of ikigai. And as we know, the Western idea of ikigai is this framework of doing something that you love, that you're good at, that the world needs, and that you can be paid for. 
which really has nothing to do with Ikigai at all as a framework. There, there, there is no framework. But, yeah, I'm, I'm so glad I, I contacted you and that we explored leisure being not, not just a source of Ikigai, but it, it can have this incredible impact on our life, especially in you know, our interpersonal relationships. As you say, our, our jobs or our employment is fragile. We, we all think we have stability if we get a job, but you know, we, we can get fired or we can have this pandemic or, um, I mean, I've been telling my friends this, this five-day lockdown has happened over Valentine's Day and all these florists in Melbourne, within the space of an afternoon, they find out it doesn't matter how much you've invested, if you've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in you know, roses, you won't be able to open to sell them. And I just couldn't believe it what I was hearing these these poor florists on TV saying, I've just spent, you know, $100,000 on roses and I can't sell them. This emphasis on work, meaningful work is important, but we, we can get a, a great sense of ikigai in leisure activities. I, I really believe when you self-actualize, it's, it's not about being the best version of yourself. It's about, um, I think Cameo used this, that it's, it's using your unique imagination to express your creative self. And leisure is one of these areas we can do that. And I love this idea of serious leisure, and it's something I hope to pursue in, in my music making. So it's been a, a wonderful journey, Shen, learning from you. So let's, let's summarise everything we've talked about on, on these three episodes. So in episode four, we, we talked about how valued experiences in leisure activities can perhaps be the easiest way and most meaningful way for us to experience Ikigai. Then in episode 17, we talked about the importance of interpersonal experiences in relation to Ikigai, where we want to experience Ibasho and be ourselves when sharing and communicating experiences with our friends, family and others. And let's just touch on what Ibasho means, Shin. Sure. This is Ibasho is the uh, interpersonal side of Ikigai that I uh, found important. And it's about authentic relationship that where you can be who you think you really are. I mean, it's really philosophical question about like who we really are. That's a, that's a question. But it's also a fact that uh, many of us, actually a lot of us have this sense that, you know, this version of me, whatever you're doing, whatever you're feeling, whatever you're saying feels right to you. And just be consistent with that. And that's very important across social relationship. Or at least find a small pocket of relationship where you can be that version of you. And also another important element is getting this genuine care. And also giving genuine care that uh, between you and the people who are close to you. Do you feel like you're caring for that person? Do you care about the other person? For their own sake, not just the benefit, the potential you can get out of that person or relationship, the vice versa. Do you feel the other party cares about you just because, just because it's you and it's just nothing more. And those relationships are very, very valuable. And it, it was very interesting to hear that from Japanese university students, because you may expect that uh, Jap Japan and other East Asian countries tend to be more collectivistic and there's a full relationship oh, for sure, you should have a lot of authentic and good relationships, but that's not necessarily true. And Nick, you may probably speak to that based on your experience in Japan too, that when the society is so based on relationship and connections and networks and you know whatnot, really a lot of relationship and the stuff that we do, interpersonal you know, interactions become driven by ulterior motives sometimes, you know, to a degree, right? To a degree. So the relationship and interaction become a bit inauthentic. It's really an oasis for those students that these relationship, authentic relationships are in their everyday process of navigating, negotiating those relationships, really pockets of relationship where you can just drop everything and just be who they are. And that was definitely a uh, key factor in terms of their ikigai. This, this word, Ibasho, that you shared with my coaching group has become a very important word to, um, I mean, to all of my uh, members of Ikigai tribe, but in 
particular one person, uh, Julie, uh, a lovely French lady, and she said one day to the group that when we meet online every week, it really feels like my eBay show. And it, the way she said it, it actually brought tears of joy to my eyes. I just The way she said it, and she said, I, I can talk about things I don't talk about to friends, even to my family. And she said, here, I feel mm-hmm. comfortable. And she knows she's cared for by everyone and, and she cares about everyone. I was just, I think I was overwhelmed that, wow, we're, you know, we're all online. We haven't met in person, but there is this sense of community. We can all be ourselves. And I, I felt so privileged with this, this small group of people who have now become dear friends. And this, this word has become extremely important to, to Julie. So mm-hmm. thank you, Shin, for sharing this knowledge and this another amazing Japanese word. So it's you're, you're changing lives. So you need to know that. Oh, no. thank you. Well, I'm I'm very glad to hear that. And uh, yeah, Julian, you picked that and actually used in your life because I think that that's what uh, it all about research and teaching and whatnot. That it, it's there for people to use and uh, want people to use it. I think so. I wanted to also take a time to thank you, Nick. That. You know, this kind of work, it's a lot of work, podcast and whatnot, and I think it's a lot of work. And this is a type of work that not a lot of us, researchers, professors, and all those people are not necessarily good at. <laughs> you know? So I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very important work that you do, and uh, I, I appreciate you, and I'm pretty sure a lot of other Ikigai researchers really uh, appreciate you being an ambassador, if you will, of the Ikigai, and they're really, you know, trying to push that and also creating uh, next generations of people who are also interested and inspired by Ikigai. So, yeah, thank you. Oh, I really appreciate that, Chin, and thank you. And it, it's actually been just such a privilege to learn and, and be able to speak to people who you know, put so much love into this, this concept, such as yourself and others. It's been an absolute joy and I'll definitely have you back on the podcast when you've completed more research and we, we touched on this before before the podcast but also having you as a, a guest presenter in the Ikigai Tribe a coaching program that would be be an honor so um, I look forward to you also being a part of that. Sounds great I'll be looking forward to that too. Awesome Shin thank you I will I'll let you go and we'll, we'll touch base soon. Definitely thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Ikigai podcast. To download Ikigai worksheets, to take the Ikigai questionnaire, or to join the Ikigai tribe, please visit ikigaitribe.com.